If you would take out your sermon outline, and um, those of you in the bridge class, you'll get a sermon outline over with Pastor Martin in the church office. You can turn in your Bible to page 1190 in the Pew Bible, or follow along with me um, as we read a passage that often pastors would choose not to preach from. But we're the church where you, we just take the scriptures as it comes to us. And so give attention now to this word from Hebrews chapter 4, verses 4 through 12. He writes, For it is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift and have shared in the Holy Spirit, and have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come and then have fallen away to restore them again to repentance since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding him up to contempt. For land that has drunk the rain that often falls on it and produces a crop useful to those for whose sake it is cultivated, receives a blessing from God. But if it bears thorns and thistles, it is worthless and near to being cursed, and its end is to be burned. Though we speak in this way, yet in your case, beloved, we feel sure of better things, things that belong to salvation. For God is not unjust so as to overlook your work and the love that you have shown for his name in serving the saints as you still do. And we desire each one of you to show the same earnestness, to have the full assurance of hope until the end, so that you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who, through faith and patience, Inherit the promises. So far then, the reading of God's word. I remember taking a psychology class, um, and on the first day, the professor came in, put his briefcase down on the desk, and with a frown, looked over the class and he said, those of you who do not do the reading in this course will fail the class. I put all the reading assignments in your syllabus week after week. Those of you who ignore the reading, again, will fail the class. And then he smiled. And then he said, this is going to be a great class. And you all are in this class because this is an elective course and you chose to be here and I'm excited to get to know each one of you. Uh, the experiments that we do are so interesting. And the reading is actually fascinating and you'll enjoy doing it. And I'm going to do everything I can to help you succeed and to learn all that you can in this class and we're going to have a great semester together. And you know what? We did. What did that psychology professor do? Well, he started off with a warning, a stern warning. And then he followed it up with encouragement and hope and an assurance that this was going to be a great class that we were going to have together. And that is, in essence, what the writer to the Hebrews does here in this sixth chapter of Hebrews. In the middle of the chapter, he gives another stern warning. But then he follows it up with a word of encouragement. He turns 180 degrees and he speaks personally to each one of you, he says, to encourage your heart today. And, well, again, we don't pick and choose which scriptures we listen to, and so it's good for us to hear both, I think, both the warning as well as the encouragement that follows it. So I take my outline this morning from the text. You'll see the four points listed there. And uh, they break out pretty clearly. 
And as we come to the first point, point number one, hear the warning. If you deliberately apostatize and maintain contempt for Jesus Christ, you cannot be restored to repentance. That's in verses 4 through 6. Now, it's so interesting. He couches this warning as he lists the wonderful blessings that fall on the assembly of the church. You notice that there in verse 4. He says something is impossible, but he doesn't say what is impossible until the middle of verse 6. And in between this one long sentence, he speaks of the beautiful things that God gives to his church. What does he speak about? He speaks on, of those who have been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, have shared in the Holy Spirit and have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come. Blessings. These are beautiful blessings that he gives to us. He says they are enlightened. And what he means by this is that they, they hear the, and taste the goodness of the word of God and the gospel. And you know what? It's clear. It's cogent. It is profound. And it addresses the issues of life and the issues of faith. It makes sense. It is, God's word is clear and cogent and profound in addressing us. And they taste, he says, of the heavenly gift. Now, some people think that's talking about communion or the Lord's Supper. Other people think that the tasting of the heavenly gift is that, that experience we have in worship when heaven gets close, when heaven intrudes onto us here and as we sing and pray and, and, and gather and enjoy each other's company, it's like... It's like the most wonderful spiritual food for us. And we taste this heavenly gift. The word of God, well, the psalmist tells us is sweeter than honey, right? Sweeter than the honeycomb. And we taste of the word of God again. And then we see around us the work of the Holy Spirit touching people's lives. People are changed. Marriages are healed. People in hard times have hope. And we see the heavenly gift that God gives to us. The power of the age to come intrudes into the assembly of God's people. What a great blessing it is. And then he becomes unhappy. Letter B in your outline. Because you see, these heavenly blessings are not beautiful to everyone. And we think about those in the church who turn away and reject Christ. For you see, verse 4, it was impossible. Now verse 6, and then have fallen away to restore them again to repentance since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding him up to contempt. What do we learn here? What we learn is the church is filled with true believers and those who have experienced the blessings, the heavenly blessings all around them, and then renounce their faith. They, here's a, here's a special word, they apostatize or they commit apostasy. What does that word mean? The word apostasy, it means to abandon or to renounce their faith. And those people, he says, experience the blessings. And yet, it is all still done underneath in unbelief. They find themselves actually judging God. They find themselves not warm toward Christ. He holds no attraction anymore to them. And they turn away. From Jesus. When we studied together chapter 3, remember he, he was always going back to Psalm 95, talking about the people Israel in the wilderness when Israel um, had all these blessings. Remember, the manna from heaven came down. 
Remember the water from the rock flowed. They could smell the sacrifices for sin at the tabernacle. They saw the pillar of fire, the very presence of God. Gerhardus Voss talks about the ph phenomenal, all the phenomenon that they saw that was evidence. And yet they did not believe. And that was in one of the earlier warnings. And in the New Covenant, the same thing happens. People experience many, many blessings around them. And yet, they will renounce their allegiance to the Son of God. This is not surprising. From the earliest time in the book of Genesis, when Cain, the son of Adam, rejects the worship of God and sin crouches at his door and wants to have him and sin has its way with him and he apostatizes, he turns away from God. I could go on, but there is that wicked king Jeroboam, son of Nabat, who led Israel to sin. We read that again and again. Who sets up the high places, the golden calves in, in other places. A new religion, depart from faithfulness to God. Or in the New Covenant, well, then we have, we have Judas. Judas, the disciple of Jesus, who said, watch and see the one that I kiss, and arrest him, and he betrays Jesus with a kiss. The Apostle Paul speaks of Demas, he said. Demas, who must have been a trusted associate in the ministry, and he says, Demas deserted me. others who do harm. And so this warning comes, and it's, it says apostasy will happen. And when that happens, as long as those continue in that rejection of Christ and that contempt for Christ, they have become like those who take up hammer and nails again and nail Jesus to the cross. So great is their disrespect and contempt for Him. It is impossible for them to be restored. And so there's a warning back in Hebrews 4, verses 1 and 2. We read this, Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us fear, lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. For good news came to us, just as to them. But the message they heard did not benefit them because they were not united by faith with those who listened. And I ask you today, do you hear the warning? How do I understand it? Well, let's go to point number two because the writer to Hebrews unpacks this for us in verses 7 and 8. And he explains that we should pay attention to farmland and how farmland responds to rainfall. Some of you grew up in rural areas. You know exactly what he's talking about. Listen to verse 7. This is letter A under point 2. For, for land that has drunk the rain that often falls on it and produces a crop useful to those for whose sake it is cultivated receives a blessing from God. And what he gives us here is like a mini parable. It's just a mini parable of farmland and fields that yield different crops in response to the rain that God sends. And if you know your Bible, you know, for example, the prophet Isaiah sometimes speaks of God's word falling like rain on the parched earth. In Isaiah 44, verse 3, he says, for I will pour out water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. I will pour my spirit on your offspring. You see, it's a spiritual picture on your offspring. And they shall spring up among the grass like willows by the flowing streams. And the picture here is that God is pleased and the people are blessed. And the assembly of God's people, North Shore Community Church, North Shore Community Church, the people of God are a worshiping community, drinking in the rain. 
They are a missional community about doing the business of God in evangelism and mercy and good deeds. They are a nurturing community, building one another up, caring for, loving, nurturing each other in faith. The rain has fallen and the blessing is ours. But, letter B, there's a contrast in verse 8. The farmland receives rain and it yields worthless weeds and it deserves God's curse. Verse 8, but if it bears thorns and thistles, it is worthless and near to being cursed and its end is to be burned. And again, the writer knows that the Old Testament prophets use the rain imagery in a sad way. Isaiah 5, verse 2, God has tended his vineyard. In my vineyard I looked for it to yield grapes, and it yielded stinking grapes. Or the King James Version says it yielded sour grapes, worthless grapes. And now when we look at verse 8, the writer of Hebrews is helping us understand how the apostate were. They heard with unbelief, and they are like weeds in the church, and they are left outside. They remove themselves from the covenant community because of their contempt for the Lord. This is painful. This is painful to read and to remember. What do we learn from this? Let her see. This is important to me. It is that all those warnings we heard in chapter 2 and chapter 3 and in chapter 5, you know what? We need to take them seriously. When he says, do not drift, that's what happens. And people begin to drift away from the Lord and they drift over the waterfall and over the cliff with hardness of heart. He says, do not harden your heart. And that's what happens. A cold ice forms caking around the heart. A cement begins to harden. And a contempt arises for the things of God. And they fall away. Those who become dull of hearing. I don't want to hear this anymore. And it says, remember, we saw it last week, they can't distinguish good from evil. They're calling what is good evil. They're calling what is evil good. They are confused. And tragically, they are committing what, what Jesus calls the unpardonable sin. Do you remember that when we studied through the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 12? And I won't go through all of that again, but the committing of the unpardonable sin, that is when Jesus delivers, he does an exorcism and delivers this tortured man from demons. And instead of rejoicing, what did the Pharisees say? Oh, Jesus, he does this by the power of Beelzebul. He's the devil. They call Jesus the devil. And Jesus says, oh no, it is by the Spirit of God that the finger of God delivers this man. And you dare to call what the Spirit of God is doing evil. That is blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. That will not be forgiven. And there are people like this who seem to draw near. They look like they come close to Christ and they now reject Him. People will do that. And I hope that is none of you. I hope that is no one watching online or in the bridge class. I hope that's no one who's watching the recording of this. But the warning has come to us. There are those who will do that. We call it apostasy. Now listen, I am no great student of apostasy. <clears throat> But I have been a pastor for nearly 40 years, and so I've seen it. And I'll tell you what I usually see. What I usually see goes something like this. First of all, there is usually moral apostasy. 
And in the mind and in the heart of the person, they begin to say, you know, I don't like the moral restrictions from God. Though the scriptures uh, place these restrictions on me, uh, I don't like it. And frankly, it's usually sexual autonomy that they desire. It, it, four out of five times anyway, that's the beginning. I want to be able to sleep with my girlfriend. And who are you to suggest that homosexuality is a sin? And where do you get off uh, telling me what I can do in the privacy of my own bedroom? And... I know better than this. And there is a moral apostasy that happens, and so soon we have to compromise our doctrine of Scripture. Surely Scripture can't be right on these things. And my heart is hardened, and I sail away with contempt for the Word of God. Look, temptation is powerful, I know, you know. Satan doesn't bait the hook with, with, you know, rotten fruit. He baits the hook with a nice juicy worm. Sin is attractive. Sin, the Bible says, is pleasant. So why would God want to restrict your pleasure? If this is happening to you, I am willing glad any of our elders are willing to talk with you about this. Let's talk about it. You've got to be able to talk about it in the church. The second apostasy usually happens against the church. What I mean by this is that many people come to the place in their life where they say, you know, I don't want the church telling me what to believe and how to live. And you know, they're a bunch of hypocrites. Haven't you studied church history? <laughs> Haven't you seen the folly of the church through the centuries and things that they've done? And, you know, the fact is, there is a lot of lunacy in, in the church. There are a lot of groups that call themselves churches that do all kinds of nutty, foolish, unbiblical things. I hope that's not the North Shore Community Church. If you see where we have slipped off into heresy or we have slipped off into immorality or we have slipped off in, in, in an abuse of, of people and abuse of power, by all means, come, let's talk. Let's talk. But there arises inside the sinful flesh what we call around here the lust for autonomy. That's a fancy philosophical way of saying what the poet said, I shall be the captain of my soul. I shall be the master of my fate. And the church has no place to tell me what to believe or how to live. Again, do you see that kind of lunacy and nuttiness here? Let's talk about it. Let's go to the Lord with it. That's the second kind of apostasy. But then there is theological apostasy. And that, that path that I've observed often follows a rejection of the sovereignty of God, followed by a rejection of what the Bible says about the corruption of man, because that includes me, and I don't like to have my own sinfulness revealed to me, a rejection of the sovereignty of God, a rejection of the sinfulness of man, leading to a rejection of the necessity of the atonement, a rejection of the cross of Christ, leading to, inevitably, a, a, uh, an abandonment of the authority of Scripture. And there's all kinds of theological nuttiness out there. And we want to be like the Bereans, don't we? Who were they? They carefully searched the scriptures. They studied carefully. We want to be a church that says, hey, let's keep ourselves in alignment with what the Bible teaches. To avoid the theological apostasy that leads people to, here's the, here's the popular modern term, to deconstruct their faith. 
And I get so frustrated. I must tell you, I see some of these websites. You know, the news media will loves to point out lunacy and stupidity in the church, and they love to, tr to uh, applaud those megachurch pastors who have said to the world, I no longer am a Christian. I renounce my faith, and I'm starting a new website to help others of you get free from the shackles of Jesus Christ and the Scriptures. I'm not going to even tell you who they are, because they're like wolves in sheep's clothing. It's hot stuff today to help young people get free from the shackles of theological orthodoxy and moral purity and of the, of the, the grip of the church, they say, which loves them. Richard Phillips says, to repudiate Christ is in effect to take up hammer and nails and beat them into his hands and feet to make common cause with those who crucify him. And oh, the apostate says, I really don't want to nail Jesus to the cross again. I'm too nice to do that. But he says, that is what you are doing when you have tasted the heavenly gift and you scorn him with contempt. Oh, 1 John 2.19 explains this to us. Do you see the text? They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us, but they went out that it might become plain that they are not of us. Those who went out from us were never of us. He's repeating himself so that it's clear. They've given up the disguise of being a Christian. I really am not. Now, what if you know people like that? We're still at the end of point two here. What if you know people like that? Does that mean you don't pray for them or you don't love them or you don't pursue them? Of course not. No. You don't know if they are Judas or Peter. You don't know their hearts. Yeah, Peter messed up, but Peter repented and came back. So you don't know. So what do you do? What you do is you remember the words that Jesus spoke when his disciples heard him talk about, you know, how hard it was for rich people to be saved, to enter the kingdom of God. And, and they said, who then can be saved? What did Jesus say? He said, with man it is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. So pray for those who have wandered and who have strayed. Love on them. Listen to them. Engage in respectful, let them give you permission, respectful conversation about the issues. The scriptures are strong enough. They can hammer away on the anvil of scripture. Their hammers will eventually break. We want to leave room for the sovereign power of God. And in this church, we have people who wandered and who've come home. So, that's point two. Turn over your outline. As the text continues, what do you see? There is not only the warning, but now we see that the writer to the book of Hebrews is a pastor. And he brings a word of reassurance to his, he calls them his beloved his beloved hearers. Just like my psychology professor I told you about at the beginning, just like he did, he was very stern with us in his opening sentences, but then his warmth and his engagement and his encouragement were so attractive. It was really very attractive. He starts out and he says, verse 9, though we speak in this way, yet in your case, beloved, we feel sure of better things, things that belong to salvation. Beloved, I want you to hear that word applied to you. We believe better things. This is extraordinary. You know, maybe you're here today because your wife made you come or your dad made you come or, or it was just your custom to come. You're addressed today 
by this text. You are beloved. I want you to believe this. I want you to know this. He says, we're convinced of better things. Better than what? Better than the curse that was just mentioned. Why is he confident? Because he sees what is going on in their life. Letter B under point two, point three, letter B under point three. Why? Because God remembers the love you have shown for his name. God has remembered your serving of the saints that you still do. God is not unjust. He has heard you love his name as we praise the Lord, as our worship team calls us to worship, and, and as we love his name together as we sing and pray, God heard, heard it and was happy. It was a sweet sound in his ears. There was that time when you actually put someone else's interest ahead of yourself because you're a Christian and you, you were generous with the sociologist, they're confused with what is called disinterested benevolence. Remember that term, disinterested benevolence? That's when you actually give money that helps people you don't even know. People don't do that, but Christians do. God has seen you do that. You've gone on mission trips. You've served the children. You just did good deeds because you loved Jesus. God sees it and he is pleased. It's not, it's not so that you are saved. I'm always hammering this home. You don't do these good things in order to be saved. You do these good things because you are saved. Do you understand? And God sees. Keep on loving and serving. And now we move to point four. In verses 11 and 12. And remember, my psychology professor said, come to every class expecting to learn. He said, stay engaged. Enjoy the experiments that we do. Take notes in the reading. You'll find them fascinating. You'll finish well. And the writer to Hebrews does the same thing right here. What does he tell you in verses 11 and 12? Letter A. Let's ask. What does earnestness for assurance of hope look like in your life? We desire, verse 11, we desire each one of you to show the same earnestness, to have full assurance um, of hope until the end. Look at that phrase, each one of you. Can I say that again just as I describe the word beloved? He now says each one of you. If you're watching online, if you're in the bridge class right now, if you've stumbled into this room today, or even if, again, somebody made you come, he addresses each one of you. You say, Lord, I haven't been listening to you very much lately. Well, now he wants your attention, each one of you. I want you to have assurance of hope. Because God is the God of hope. That's in Romans 15, 13. God is the God of hope. How dark is it? It may be dark. How difficult are the circumstances you are facing? How much pain is your body in? How much sorrow and sadness is in your heart? Yes, it may be hard, but God is the God of hope. I, I was reminded yesterday of, of a cartoon I had seen many years ago of a frog being swallowed by a pelican, okay? The frog has his head, the, the pelican has the frog's head in his gullet, in his beak, and the body is, is hanging out of the mouth of the pelican. And you know what that frog does? That frog doesn't give up. That frog locks his hands around the throat of the pelican and says, you're not gonna swallow me. And the pelican's eyes begin to bulge. <laughs> and that frog says, I'm not giving up. He has hope. Yeah, the circumstances are grim, but he has hope. And the pelican's eyes begin to bulge. 
And the caption says, never give up. Never give up. And there are Christians who understand this. Never give up. I know. I've seen it so many times. The same thing happens to two different people. They have suffering. They have sadness. They have heartache. They have temptation and difficulty. And it drives them away from Jesus Christ. And someone else has sadness and trial and difficulty and illness and temptation. And what does it do? They know that their God is the God of hope and it drives them to Jesus Christ. They come to Jesus Christ and they remember what he said in John chapter 10. You know this? My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Oh, friend. You know, many people wonder, have I committed the unpardonable sin? <laughs> it's not uncommon. Everybody might ask that question. Am I in the path to apostasy? And what I say to my friends who ask me that question is I say, well, the very fact that you're worried about committing the unpardonable sin shows that you haven't committed the unpardonable sin because people who committed the unpardonable sin don't give a rip about Jesus Christ. They only have contempt for the things of God. And that's not you. Now, if you're, if you're rollerblading down the hill toward the edge of the cliff, <laughs> Let's, uh, let's put on the brake. And I'm happy to take any of you to lunch if you want to talk about it, if you want to say, yeah, I understand what you were saying about moral apostasy. I think I'm on that road. Or I understand what you're saying about uh, apostasy against the church. I think I might be paddling down that stream toward the waterfall. I, I understand what you said about theological apostasy where I've been doing a dance. I've been doing a dance with a lot of unbiblical thoughts. And you know, those moves, they're pretty cool. And I, and, and I, but maybe I need to go sit on the sideline and get out of the dance for a while. Well, you don't have to talk to me, any of our elders, of our pastors, anybody who you know has godly spiritual wisdom. You can talk to them. But let's be a church where you have the liberty to talk and to ask. Yeah, I might not be that bright. I'll say, well, let's go explore this together, but we'll go to the Word of God, and God's Word is firmly established in the heavens. It can bear up under any question. So he says in verse 12, so that you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. He actually says, be imitators of those around you who have faith. Look in the, around this room. There are great examples for us of people. They're not perfect, but they're walking with the Lord. Or read a good Christian biography. When's the last time you read a good Christian biography? You know, of David Brainerd or Jonathan Edwards or of Elizabeth Elliot, of C.S. Lewis. You know, Follow their example. George Mueller, the man of prayer. Let me conclude. The warnings in verses 4 through 8 are good for us to hear. We don't ignore any scripture. Who among us wants to have contempt for Jesus Christ? Who wants to abandon the faith? But the encouragement of verses 9 through 12 are so good for you to hold. They are written in the second person. They're written in the second, to you, to you, to each of you, to you. Do you hear his voice calling you beloved this day? 
You know that you are beloved. How? If you hear his voice saying, I loved you and gave myself for you, when you see the cross and you are grateful, that's how you know. Are you grateful for the love of the one who, lo- who Jesus who gave himself up for you? If you've been drifting, put on the brakes, turn around, take your place in the midst of the assembly with heavenly blessing. Let's pray now, shall we? Our heavenly Father, we need you. It's not our works that save us. It's not even our faith that saves us. It's Christ who saves us. We pray for any friends that we know, Lord, who, who have questions, objections. We pray that you would give us divine appointments to be an encouragement to them, to help them to see the truth of your word and to understand what it means to be beloved of God. In Jesus Christ, help us, Lord, to be faithful. Bring the strangers home. Bring the wanderer home, we pray. And then we pray for ourselves, and we tell you, Lord, that we need you. Not just once a week. Every hour we need you, and we are grateful for you. So, as we sing this song now, Lord, confirm in every heart that we are beloved in your eyes. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand.